I was sent to an older video out there claiming they have several proofs that evolution isn't true. Let's take a look at evolution has gone from dumb to <sighs> stupider. Stupider? Bah! Don't you worry, my evolutionary friends. We will be embarrassed for you. Don't sweat it. I get the feeling we're all going to be embarrassed having to sit through this. Yes. Hello, and welcome to our wretched. My name is Todd Friel. I am your host. The wretch the song refers to nothing became something. It blew up and became, well, everything. In a nutshell, that is the fairy tale known as evolution. No, no it isn't. Evolution in general refers to the change in biological organisms via natural selection. In, as he says, a nutshell, organisms will have slight changes, and if those changes help survive and breed, they'll have a better chance to survive and breed, passing on those changes. Changes that are detrimental to an organism will be weeded out through less of a chance to breed. That, in a nutshell, is the theory of evolution. It is absolutely ridiculous, but these days it has become entirely nonsensical. Would like to share with you three headlines. No, we did not make these up. The first headline, I'm going to just have to let you read it for yourself. Here it is. That's the theory. Yes, that's the theory, listed in eminent scientist Glenn Beck's site, The Blaze. It reports on a paper that says dinosaurs expelled gases, which increased the global temperature. How exactly does this disprove evolution? Like other organisms, it's very likely that dinosaurs expelled waste. That is one big pile of shit. Like most land animals, their waste came in solid, liquid, and, well, gas. Basically, the original paper that you don't cite says that because of the amount of vegetation they could and had to eat, it's calculated that seropod dinosaurs would expel a tremendous amount of waste gases, much more than current animals. Bigger animals produce bigger farts. Who knew? Anyway, this increase in waste gases would contribute to global warming at the time. Uh, they go on even a little bit further in the article. Basically, dinosaur gas blew a hole in the ozone layer, which caused the rays to come down and make them go extinct. No, that's not what the original paper was saying. It says nothing about the extinction of dinosaurs, simply that their environment changed because of the waste they put out. The Smithsonian put out an interesting response to the misunderstanding of this article, asking media outlets to at least try to understand what it's saying and not treat it like some new theory about the extinction of dinosaurs. If nothing else, taking the study out of context and claiming it says things it doesn't is lying and makes you untrustworthy. Doesn't your holy book say certain things about that? I mean, I could take your words out of context and say you don't want people to read the Bible at all. Stop reading scriptures. But it would be unethical for me to do that. Now, mind you, it was just the dinosaurs. I, I don't, we haven't worked out the details on that just yet, but basically, that's the new theory. Really? What happened to the big volcano thing or the meteorite idea? Well, details, details. The Chicxulub of meteor impact is still the leading theory of the major extinction event that wiped out what we think of as dinosaurs. Basically, a massive body hit the earth, throwing up enough debris to block out heat from the sun, causing a global dropping of temperatures that the large dinosaurs and other animals that had become accustomed to warmer temperatures could not deal with. So, dinosaur farts contributed to the KT extinction event in the same way that a lead miner contributes to mass shootings. And even if it was discovered that dinosaurs were killed directly by their expelled gases, rather than a meteorite as previously believed, how does that disprove evolution? New information changes all the time. In a thousand years, it might be discovered that a different event actually killed the dinosaurs. What really killed the dinosaurs? Me! That's the great thing about science. It improves and changes as new information is gathered. Let's see what he has next. Outlandish headline number two. This one I'll read if you don't mind. Evolution may help explain prolific texting and tweeting. What? Huh? 
You, did they have this back then? No. The book the article is referring to says that our online behavior can be traced back to evolutionary changes that our ancestors took advantage of, such as attempting to get more prestige in the tribe back then, relating to saying provocative things to get noticed in social media now. In other words, much of our behavior of modern day humans can be traced back to our ancestors. It's not talking with a physical act of texting, but rather tries to account for how many people behave online. This comes underneath the heading of evolutionary psychology. You see, what we do is we go dig up some bones and we say this is what they used to think like, therefore this is what we think like. Apparently this has something to do with hierarchy or something like that. You have evolutionary psychology backwards. We don't just dig up some bones and say this is how people behaved, therefore we think like this. It's the other way around. We look at how humans behave now and try to understand what adaptions our ancestors would have had to have to account for them. For example, as I've noted in other videos, we tend to care about those within our personal in-groups. We can work out the evolutionary advantage of this to conclude that since our ancestors did better when they worked together, they evolved a way to care about those around them. All right, just to prove how dumb evolution is, Adrian, if you'd be so kind. All right, David, uh, 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 come here. All right, mm -hmm. kind of move your camera to the side if you can, mm -hmm. possibly. Can you do that? Mm -hmm. Not really? All right, now, it's, it's 10,000 years from now, and they dig up David. What sort of story do you think they'd write as opposed to digging up my bones? What would the evolutionary picture look like? And you go, well, wow, it'd be pretty different. I'm not sure what you're getting at here that if future archaeologists dug you up, they would assume that everybody would look just like you, down to your exact height and bone size? They can make estimates of what is found, but it would be folly to assume that one example would be representative of everybody. Look, go to an airport, go to the shopping mall if you'd like to. And just, okay, you ever seen this guy? They dig up his bones, and then they're going to say, based on these bones, this is what the story looks like. Yes, somebody walking like that would be able to tell future archaeologists and biologists what life was like. For instance, that old man you seem to be miming was most likely suffering from arthritis. We can use the fact that not as many bones as we have dug up in the past show symptoms of such an ailment to determine how likely it was to occur in the past, and that it's occurring more often now, meaning that our current lives may be contributing to it, not simply genetics. It's absolutely ridiculous. Even more ridiculous is figuring out what them bones thought like to try to figure out why we think the way we do. Absolute nonsense. That's because they don't use bones to directly figure out how people think. Evolutionary psychologists will use what we know about people, what we have found in the past, tools, migration patterns, genetic drift, and what we understand about the theory of evolution to work out why we act in certain ways. But wait! One more evolutionary headline, this from New Zealand. The universe from nothing rattles faith. What you got here is a book review by a mm, scientist stating the universe came from nothing. Yet again, you're referring to an article regarding a scientist's findings, not the actual work of the scientist. It's almost as if you don't want to look into the original documents themselves. And I have to interject, what does all this have to do with evolution? This is the formation of the universe. Evolution, as I mentioned, is the explanation for the diversity of life. How the universe formed has nothing to do with how mutations that leave creatures better suited to their environment a better chance to pass on those mutations. And to get this out of the way, yes, because of the sexual misconduct allegations, Krauss, the author of the book being reviewed, was removed from his position and barred from the campus of ASU. Go Wildcats! His misconduct, while abhorrent, does not change the results of his findings. Let me share with you some quotes from the article. Our universe formed from nothing. Actually, it's a special kind of nothing because you used to think that nothing was nothing? Well, you religious people are wrong because it was a special kind of nothing. Back to the article. The author's view, the idea of nothing, has shifted. He claims the universe could spring from nothing by natural and measurable processes. You see, once you've got measurable and processes or processes, whichever you prefer, 
you no longer have nothing. Not exactly. Krauss is basically saying that the net energy needed to create the energy in the universe balances out with the expansion of the universe. In other words, we don't need an outside source of energy to form and expand the universe. It doesn't cost anything because the energy values balance themselves out. The author himself said this, Lulu. I'm talking about the creation of space itself here. If physicists have changed the meaning of nothing compared to what philosophers, read religious people, wanted, it just points out the sterility of philosophy slash religion compared to science. Basically what Crowes is saying is that science can and has changed. What we thought of as nothing is actually much more complex than what we understood before. In the same way that our understanding of light has changed, so that we now know it's not an instantaneous event, but that light takes time to move from one place to another. That's the glory of science. When new information comes along, it will change to accommodate the new findings. I disagree with Cross's statements on the sterility of philosophy. Philosophers can change their ideas about their understanding of the universe as well when new information is presented. Now, since Todd here keeps wanting to conflate religion and philosophy, religion is much harder to change, especially if it's based around an infallible being. It's somewhat difficult to accept infallibility and also be willing to say that the base of such could be wrong. Oh, okay, I see. Because I used to think that nothing was what this pillow was dreaming about. Oh, clever. Cribbing off Aristotle. Aristotle was a great philosopher and had some very important thoughts on ethics, but he wasn't a physicist. It's like who died and left Aristotle in charge of ethics? Plato! And if he found himself brought to today's time with our current understanding of the world, he would admit that concepts that he took for granted had changed. The number of elements to start. We have a bit more than four these days and have a better understanding of what they are. But I guess I was wrong. Nothing could actually have a special kind of nothing. Exactly. Even a region of space that we would consider nothing would have potential energy. So, even what's considered nothing apparently does have properties. Like you're going to go to the store, which by the way isn't nothing, and look at the counter and say, you know, I'm looking for a nothing, but uh, I think I'd like a special kind of nothing, not the old nothing that we used to think was nothing, this new uh, bobbing nothing. I'm not sure exactly where you're going with this store analogy. That if you can't order a special kind of nothing from a store, it doesn't exist? You really want to go there, Todd? Try going to a store and ordering some deity. You'll get the same response. Back to the article. He describes an empty space pulsating with energy. Okay, hold on a second right there. You got to stop right there. An empty space that is pulsating with energy is not empty. It's got energy and it's got pulsatings. It's not nothing. And shaking with electromagnetic fields. Okay, electromagnetic fields. Color me kooky, not nothing. And what he calls virtual particles, apparently a special kind of nothing virtual particle, which bob in and out of existence. The point about virtual particles is that they're the only way to account for certain measurements of fluctuations in energy. Sometimes we can't measure things directly, like dark matter, but we can infer their existence by the effects they give on other things. Now I'm catching on. No wonder why evolution is a fact? Considering that none of your arguments have disproven evolution in any way, and at best only tangentially relate to it, I assume you're being sincere in your accepting of evolution now. Great. <sighs> yeah, nothing he said came close to questioning, let alone disproving evolution, but he thinks he has. Damn, you're probably right voices in my head. Yes, it's a fact that things change and there's a diversity of life on this planet. Evolution via natural selection is the theory that lines up with our observations and accounts for that. Well, another video over with. As always, if you find something out there I'd be interested in, send it my way. I don't like fancy learning books. I don't like apple tarts. I don't like cozy breakfast nooks. I don't like modern arts. Well, I like farts. Ah! Yes, I like farts. I like long farts, short farts, wet farts, your farts. I like farts. Look at that. By the way, two words for the doctor. Dinosaur flatulence. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm sorry. Am I back in my improv class? Dinosaurs fart. Yes. And? <laughs>